G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Ezekiel. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So thanks for coming along. In this session, we're up to session three. We're looking at chapter one, verse 29, and chapter three, verse 21. Our last session, we saw uh, Ezekiel, he saw uh, some strange looking things. <laughs> you know, he, he, he saw this uh, uh, four living creatures. We, he saw this uh, fire within clouds coming out and and there were four four of these creatures with with each of them with different faces, with a human face, a face of a lion, face of an ox, a face of of, a, of an eagle, and uh, wings joined together, and and and, uh, and and wheels underneath them, and above that, you know, we had a, a firmament, and above that, we had the throne with someone sitting on the throne who was was uh, was God Himself. Yeah. Um, so he, he he has seen all these things, and it, it would have caused him quite a lot of consternation. So as, as we head now into the call to his prophetic office, um, we look at this in chapter 1, verse 28, the last part of verse 28, right down to chapter 3, verse 3. Um, am I recording? Yes. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. So the last part of verse 28 tells us the effect that this vision that he saw, the Shekinah glory, had on him. Uh, when he saw all that he has described in the preceding verses with the wheels within wheels and all these things, he could only do what anyone would do, especially when, when, when one recognizes that this is the visible manifestation of God's presence. What he did was he fell on his face. Uh, and throughout the Old Testament, we see when men came into the presence of God, they went down on their faces. For instance, uh, Daniel, we see that. Uh, Isaiah, in the New Testament, we see John and the island of Patmos. Now, Ezekiel, he began to listen to the one who began speaking from the throne, which is above that firmament or, or the canopy, which was above the cherubs, which were above the wheels. Remember, that's what we looked at last session. Now, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, we now see the strengthening of Ezekiel. We read of his strengthening in verse 1. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak with thee. So here we have the first of the times when the term son of man is used in this book. It's noticeable here that this expression, Ben Adam, which is son of Adam, son of man, Adam, Adam, the name came out of the Adama, the ground, it's son of man. So this is the first time this now is addressed to a prophet. And it occurs, uh, this name occurs only in Ezekiel, in whom we find it mentioned over 90 times. Now, outside the book of Ezekiel, this expression, Ben Adam, or son of man, is also found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 7. Uh, where in Daniel it says, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So every time the expression uh, is used in the Old Testament of a prophet, it is always in Ezekiel and with, the, with that one exception in Daniel. Now it's used in other places, but only in these two places, in these two books, is it used of a prophet. Now, what does son of man mean? Well, well son of man emphasizes man in his weakness and frailty, in contrast to God. So when scripture talks about the Messiah, he has the title son of man, but also son of God. And these are actually contrasting titles. One is emphasizing his humanity and the other his deity. Now, Christ's own title, the son of man in the New Testament, emphasizes the fact that he came in mortal form, in human form, so that he became capable of dying and feeling pain and many other effects of the fall. So in both testaments, old and new, this expression, son of man, emphasizes man in his human frailty and weaknesses. And by, the time of, by the time of Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse, uh, verses 13 and 14, this title had taken on uh, near messianic implications. And in the Old Testament, the term son of man never became a messianic title as such. It is only in the Jewish writings of the intertestamental period and between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament 
that we find the expression son of man being used as a messianic title. And once we get into the New Testament writings, where Jesus himself uses son of man in its messianic sense, it was already established as a messianic title in the writings of Judaism at that time. Now, the voice that speaks from the throne issues a command to stand upon your feet. Remember, he was, he was face down. The purpose is because God intends to speak with him. What God wants to speak to him about is his call to the prophetic office. In verse 2, we read of the Holy Spirit's work. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. So here we have uh, an example of the Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament. Uh, you remember, he did indwell some people in the Old Testament. Uh, there are many things the Holy Spirit does in both Testaments, such as regeneration. People were saved only by the Spirit's regenerating work in both periods. He also indwells people in both Testaments, but there's a huge distinction. For New Testament believers who are part of the body of Christ, the Spirit indwells all believers without exception, every believer. But in the Old Testament, he only indwelt some believers. And now these were people he was going to call for a specific mission. Another difference is in the New Testament and through to the present day, when the Holy Spirit indwells a believer uh, from New Testament time onward, he does so permanently. That is what Jesus promised the disciples. That when the Spirit comes, he will dwell in them forever. Not just until they commit us some, some sin, but forever. Now, in Old Testament times, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was not necessarily permanent. When uh, King David, for instance, when he prayed in Psalm 51, he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, that was a very valid Old Testament prayer. It's not a valid New Testament prayer because of the promises we have, that the Holy Spirit will indwell us forever. There, there are, of course, uh, other distinctions between the work of the Spirit in the Old and New Testaments, but th that's a different study. This is not what we, we're dealing with here. That's, that's pneumatology, the study of the Spirit. Now, the indwelling of the Spirit in the life of Ezekiel was necessary for him to receive the prophetic office that he's about to be given. And we know from uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, that when God calls someone to the prophetic office, the prophet was indwelt by the Holy Spirit in order to receive direct communication from God and to be able to give to his audience the very words of God himself as he speaks them. So the Holy Spirit now comes and he indwells Ezekiel. But also, he set him up on his feet. Uh, and it, it's the, 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 the Greek here is using the passive sense, uh, which means that somebody else is setting him up on his feet, not him. So notice here, the obvious lesson by comparing verses 1 to 2. In verse 1, God issues the command to Ezekiel to get to his feet. In verse 2, the Holy Spirit enters into Ezekiel, and, and the Holy Spirit himself stands him up on his feet. The point that's being made here is this. When God gives a command, he always provides the power to keep it. God never asks us to do something without giving us the power to do it. It is a matter of us appropriating the power or the grace to do the job that God has commanded us to do. But it is he who provides the necessary power and authority and, and, and so on. Now, after the Holy Spirit enters into Ezekiel and sets him upon his feet, then he says, and I heard him that spake unto me. This means he was now ready to receive this revelation from God. And then in verses 3 to 5, Ezekiel is now told about the recipients of his message. The kind of people he's now being sent to in verse 3, it's a rebellious people. God says, I send thee to the children of Israel, to nations that are rebellious. Now, Notice he uses the plural here, nations, because he's dealing with the two Jewish nations of Israel and Judah. Although Israel by this time had got into captivity a hundred years previously, yet there is no such thing as 
the 10 lost tribes of Israel, all right? Because both nations are always identifiable. It shows here that Israel was still in existence and not lost. And so, and so God tells Ezekiel to address members of both the kingdom of Judah and also those who were once part of the kingdom of Israel, showing that they were not lost at all. Many of them were still in the land. The point here is that both these kingdoms, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, had rebelled against God, not only Ezekiel's contemporary generation, but previous generations as well. This was, this was a pretty much a habitual thing. It, it, it goes on to say, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. So first of all, what do we find out? Well, God is sending Ezekiel to a rebellious people. How exciting for Ezekiel. And in verse 4, it goes on to describe them. And the children are impudent and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah. So not only... <laughs> Not only are they rebellious people, but they are also impudent people as well. The children are impudent and stiff-hearted. The literal meaning of the Hebrew word for impudent means hard of face. The Hebrew here emphasizes that they have a shameless attitude. The kind of shameless attitude a, a man has who refuses to lower his gaze when confronted with wrongdoing. He's just going to stare you down instead. They're also stiff-hearted. Literally, this means firm of heart. It, 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 what it does is it indicates here an unyielding stubbornness that refuses to give way under any circumstances. These are the types of people God is going to send Ezekiel to. It is to such people that he will have to say over and over and over again, thus says the Lord Jehovah, followed by the specific revelation that he has received. In verse 5, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. Okay. Now, Ezekiel is told that he's being sent to a people who will at least learn one lesson well. They may hear his message or they may refuse to listen to him. More likely, they're going to refuse because God reiterates that they are a rebellious house, means they're rebelling against God's rule and authority. But even if they refuse to hear what he has to say and totally refuse to obey the commands God will give them through his prophet Ezekiel, nevertheless, during the course of time, they shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. How will they know that? By means of fulfilled prophecy. Ezekiel is going to pass the test, the standard test of a true prophet given in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Any prophet could afford to give prophecies relating to the far distant future because he wouldn't be alive to answer if his predictions proved to be false. Anyone can safely give distant prophecy, and Ezekiel will give many of these. But it is a lot more difficult to give prophecies which will be fulfilled within the next year or so. More likely than not, the prophet will still be around to, to be answerable if they don't come to pass. Now, Ezekiel will not only predict the far distant prophetic future, he'll also be giving out a great number of prophecies with imminent fulfillment in his lifetime. And once these begin to come true one after the other, the people will indeed know that there has been a prophet amongst them. So while Ezekiel will find himself being rejected by the Jewish people initially, and they'll begin accusing him of speaking in Proverbs and parables and so on. Once his prophecies and parables begin to be fulfilled, we're going to see that the elders, of the Jewish people in the exile, are going to come to him to inquire what the current word of the Lord is. Yeah. This is not a very encouraging way to send anyone off in a ministry. You ordain him to the ministry, and then you tell him to go out there and give them the word. But do not forget, no one's going to listen to you. That's pretty demoralizing. It's not very encouraging. 
Do not expect great numbers to flock to your ministry. Now we can learn we can learn one big lesson from this for us today. Where when people seek to determine God's blessings by numerical growth, this is a fallacy. This was never promised to the prophets of the Old Testament or to the apostles of the New Testament. If we take numerical growth as a sign of divine favor, then we should give credit to many of the cults because they have quite large numbers as well. Now, we, you know, we're not, we're not against numerical growth, but one should never assume that by itself, numerical growth is a sign of blessing. A more certain sign of blessing is in those few who believe and accept and grow in the knowledge of the Lord. That's where you'll see, um, you know, your growth. That's a, that's a sure sign of blessing when you see those within your congregations coming to spiritual maturity. Now, after telling Ezekiel in a very negative way not to expect too much success in the, in the way of responses, in verses 6 to 7, God gives him a charge against being afraid of fulfilling his calling. In verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks. They are a rebellious house. This uh, rebellious house keeps coming over and over again. God tells Ezekiel, basically, be not afraid. All right? There are four things here, actually. Uh, first of all, do not be afraid of them. Second, do not be afraid of their words. No matter what they say to you, no matter how they might poke fun at you, do not be afraid of their words, although they are briars and thorns and scorpions. Hebrew word for briars here also has the meaning of defiers. The defiers, they are defiant and they're going to defy the word of God. Hebrew word for thorns also means to despise. They're also like scorpions. Now, scorpions, uh, they hurt painfully with their sting, but they're not deadly for humans. Third, God says, for the third time, be not afraid of their words. And fourth, nor, de nor be dismayed at their looks. Now, all four statements pretty much say the same thing. Apparently, God felt he needed to emphasize this four times over. The reason for this emphasis is at the end of verse 6. They are a rebellious house. God keeps repeating that. Then in verse 7, there's a specific charge. Thou shall speak my words unto them. Ezekiel had to keep on speaking the words of God, whether they will hear or whether they will, will forbear. And again, the point here is that they most likely will refuse to listen since God repeats himself once again, for they are most rebellious. Now, the application of verse 7. The man of God is not held accountable for the response of the audience, okay? He's held responsible for the proclamation of the message he has been given to proclaim. The motivation of the man of God is not the positive response of the hearers, but it is a fact that God gave him a message to proclaim. We've been given the message of the gospel to proclaim. We just proclaim it. The, 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 the fruitfulness of that is up to, the, up to the Lord himself. Now, here we have a little story about the roll or, or scroll of a book. And we see this in, uh, in uh, ver uh, chapter 2, verse 8, then at chapter 3, verse 3. Now, after giving Ezekiel a charge uh, not to be afraid of the people to whom God is sending him, in verse 8, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. God now gives him a warning. Ezekiel must hear what God has to say and not be rebellious himself. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. So what he's, what he's being warned about here, he's not to reflect the same kind of attitude to the word of God as the nation of Israel is reflecting. He's not to object to his calling as Moses did, for instance, in Exodus chapter 3, or as Jeremiah does in Jeremiah chapter 1. Instead, he's told to accept his call and follow it through. Open thy mouth and eat that which I give thee. It was to, it, What he was saying is, what I'm going to be telling you it's to enter the prophet's inner, innermost life. 
to be food and nourishment of his soul, to be inwardly digested and assimilated with his very flesh and blood. And in verses 9 to 10, we're told about a roll, or it's more likely a scroll, right? And, and verse 9 says, And when I looked, behold, a hand was put forth unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So while he was still looking at, at the vision, he suddenly sees the form of a hand in which is a scroll. And basically, this scroll contains within it the prophecies which Ezekiel is to give forth to the nation. So it's basically the contents of the book of Ezekiel. And in verse 10, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there were written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. So it was spread up before him. And then Ezekiel notices that it was written within and without or on both sides of the scroll. Normally, scrolls were not written this way. Usually they were written on the inside and the outside was always left blank. But in this case, Ezekiel is given a scroll written on both sides. It was so full of God's message of impending woes that it was written on both sides. This means that every available space on that scroll was filled right up. There was no room for Ezekiel to write anything of his own. And so as he looks at the content of the scroll, it's made up of three things lamentations, mourning, and woe. The bulk of the first part of Ezekiel's ministry is going to be a message concerning the destruction of the Judean kingdom, the fall of Jerusalem, and the final captivity. The point is only being hinted at here, but it will make clear when we get to chapter 3, that he must speak nothing but the words of God. There was no room for Ezekiel to pass on his own opinions. One thing to remember is that the Jewish prophets were not necessarily inspired all the time, okay? They were inspired only during those times when they were giving forth a true prophetic message from God. A good example of this is, is the story of King David when he was thinking about building a temple for God. He was discussing this with, with, with the prophet Nathan, and he asked Nathan what he thought of the idea. Nathan said, wow, that's a great idea. Go ahead and do it. But as Nathan was leaving the palace, God spoke to him and told him to go back to David and tell him not to build a temple. God had someone else in mind to build a temple. So when Ezekiel speaks, he's only to speak the words of God, not his opinions. Now, having seen what, it cont what the scroll contains in verses 1 to 3, this is chapter 3, he's now told to eat the thing. He's given two commands. The first is in verse 1, eat that which thou findest. In the Hebrew te text, the word eat is repeated. It is very emphatic. He says, eat, eat. Eat this roll and go. Speak unto the house of Israel. This shows a connection here between the scroll and his prophetic message. He first has to eat the scroll, and then having eaten it, he's to go and speak to the house of Israel. This means that the words of God must first be eaten or assimilated into his life. He needs to ponder over it, meditate upon it, virtually eat it so that it's part of his life, assimilated. He must assimilate this message. And once he has done that, it is then to be given to the nation. And the message, which is the content of the scroll, can be eaten, assimilated, and then given forth. And in verse 2, we read of Ezekiel's obedience. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll. He opened his mouth and he ate the roll. In verse 3, it's a second command. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Cause thy belly to eat. Now, having put it into his mouth and swallowed it, it now has to go down into his belly so that it become a vital part of him. This emphasizes the same thing. He is to totally assimilate the message. He obeys. Then did I eat it. And the result was, and it was in my mouth as, as honey for sweetness. A scroll like this would, would not normally be described as tasty, but this one was because it contained the words of God. Now, cast, think about it. We have two other biblical examples of this same phenomenon. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, Jeremiah eats the words of God 
and finds them just as sweet. And also we have in Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, the Apostle John eats the scroll just as Ezekiel did, and he has the same reaction. In his mouth, it tasted like the sweetness of honey. Ezekiel is to assimilate the word of God, and then he can give the message. And following that in verses 4 to 21, we come to the commissioning of the prophet, to the office of prophet. Now, we see the people and the message in verses 4 to 11 of chapter 3. Verse 4. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. Now, in verses 4 to 9, he deals with the people. Typically, in verses 4 to 7, he's told to expect opposition. Now, he's sent specifically in verse 4, he said unto me, Son of man, go. He's to go to the house of Israel and speak the words of God. So in verse 4, he's being sent to Israel. For thou art not sent to, no, here he says, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. So in verses 5 to 6, six God tells him to whom he's not being sent. He was not being sent to a people of strange speech, or literally of a deep lip. This means he's not being sent to a foreign people. He's not being sent to a foreign people with a hard language or literally a heavy tongue. Uh, this, is, this is an expression which means to a people who lack eloquence. He's not being sent to two types of people, those speaking a foreign language and those who lack eloquence. Rather, he's being sent to the house of Israel, to his own countrymen, who do not lack eloquence. Not to many, verse 6, not to many peoples of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. So he's not being sent to many peoples, but to one in particular. In other words, God is not calling Ezekiel to be a foreign missionary. He's being called to be a home missionary to the Jewish people. And God says this in the second part of verse 6, Surely, if I sent you to a foreign nation, they would listen to you. But I'm sending you to your own people, and they won't listen to you. <laughs> God emphasizes once again in verse 7, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto you. And again, Ezekiel is told to expect failure. Now, from God's personal perspective, he'll succeed. Why? Because he's going to fulfill God's will for his life but he will fail in the sense that the people will not listen to what he has to say. The obligation of the prophet, however, and of anyone who witnesses is to declare the word of God to the people. That's what we do. He's not responsible. We're not responsible for the way that they respond. We're there and he's there and we are there to simply give forth the message. The reason why they will not listen to Ezekiel the prophet God goes on to say in verse 7, is because they will not hearken on to me. That's the root cause of all their problems. If they would not listen to God, then certainly they're not going to listen to his messenger. Because the house of Israel is characterized by two things. First of all, a hard forehead. We would say a thick head. That's what we'd say. They got a thick head. Second, a stiff heart, which means a hard an unyielding attitude. They're just stubborn and stiff-necked. When God sends someone out, he gives them the power to fulfill their mission. So in verses 8 to 9, the prophet Ezekiel is now equipped for his job. Since he's going to a people with, a hard, with, 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 with hard foreheads, thick heads, in verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face hard against their faces and thy forehead, a forehead, hard against their foreheads. Because the people are too thick-skulled to hear the word of God, he's going to make Ezekiel thick-skulled, but in a different manner. God will see to it that all their attacks against Ezekiel will not intimidate him. As in, Verse 9 says, as an adamant, 
Harder than flint have I made thy forehead. He'll not be intimidated by the rejection he'll suffer. He'll be as hard as flint stone. He'll be harder than they are thorny and more adamant than they are. The word adamant here means thorny. To apply, to apply practically on what he's just said to Ezekiel's life at the end of verse 9, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. There it is again, a rebellious house. God says he's not to be afraid of them because of what he's going to turn the prophet into. He's not to be dismayed at their looks. And again, and again God confirms what he has said many times now. They are a rebellious house. You know, in verses 10, in verse 10, verse 10 to 11, we have the message. In verse 10, we have the source of Ezekiel's message, and it's God. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thy heart. Now, reiterating what has already been said in verse 10, he is to speak the words of God. He is to receive all the words that I shall speak unto thee into his heart. He is to do two things with God's word. First, receive them into his heart. Second, hear with thine ears. To receive in thy heart means to believe. Believe what I'm telling you. To hear with thine ears means to obey. So he is to believe the message and then carry out all the demands which the message contains. And in verse 11, we have the specific recipients of his message. It is they of the captivity. So he's not to go back to the Jews who are still in the land of Israel, not, in, not, not back to the Jews in Judah. The kingdom of Judah, remember, was still in existence at, that, at this point in time. Rather, he's to go to those who had been exiled in the first and second deportations. He's being sent specifically to the Jews of the exile. He is to speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord Jehovah. This is the formula used here to indicate that the prophet is about to speak the words of God. And in this case, he is to do it whether they will hear or whether they refuse to listen. He is just to present the message. That's all he is to do. Present the message. Now, in verses 12 to 15, we now come to the transportation of the prophet. In verse 12, after having heard all of these words, this is, this is from uh, which we covered tonight, from chapter 1, uh, third, last part of verse 28, down to chapter 3, 11. Having heard all of these things, suddenly the vision of the cherubs and the Shekinah glory starts to come to life again, starts to be active again. Because remember, that this, is, this is where we started off when he saw the, the vision of, of the cherubs and the, and the wheels and, and, and the Shekinah glory. Now, this verse describes a movement of the Shekinah glory being borne along by the four cherubim. It says, the spirit lifted me up and I heard behind me the voice of a great rushing. He now hears the voice of a torrent of water again. But this time he seems to be able to make it what the voice is saying. It says, blessed be the glory of Jehovah from his place. And in this vision, that statement seems to be the formula which starts the Shekinah glory moving. Verse 13, and I heard the voice, uh, I heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, and the noise of the wheels beside them, even the noise of a great rushing. So this describes the noise of the movement of this, this thing, this Shekinah glory with the wheels and the cherubim. He heard the noise of the wings as the wings of the four cherubs touched one another. Remember, the upper wings of each cherub are joined to the upper wings of the other cherubs. He also heard the noise of the wheels as of a great rushing or a torrential water flood. It's like, a, like, like what we've, we've been seeing on in, in the, in the television just recently with the floods in, in Europe and in, in uh, Lib uh, Libya. Great rushing, the rushing, roaring sound of the approaching water and rock and debris as it as it tumbles down in 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 the in the in the pathway for many miles. You could hear it. In verse fourteen, he describes a movement of the Holy Spirit. He says, 
So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. So as Ezekiel was being born along or born aloft by the spirit of God in this vision, he went feeling two things. I went in bitterness and in the heat of my spirit. That doesn't sound good. Both these terms refer to an inner struggle he's having over whether to accept the call or not. But his acceptance of the call was inevitable. Why? Because as he says, the hand of Jehovah was strong upon me. Under such divine compulsion, he cannot but accept the call he has been given. He has no choice. And in verse 15, then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib that dwelt by the river Chabah and to where they dwelt. And I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. So he arrives back home and the vision is about to end temporarily. He comes to them of the captivity, specifically to the Jews who were at Tel Abib, living along the bank of the river Chabah. Then he tells us what the effect was on himself. For seven days, he just sat there, completely overwhelmed. Hebrew word for overwhelmed means to be appalled, to be angry. For seven days, he was in an extreme, highly emotional state. Seven days. Seven days we find in Genesis chapter 50, verse 10, and 1 Samuel 31, verse 13, Seven days is a morning time. Psalm 137 says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Now, some liberal writers in Ezekiel who don't, don't believe the scriptures uh, at this point usually begin a, a lengthy discourse trying to psychoanalyze him. Uh, they've come up with a whole list of possible psychological maladies which they say Ezekiel had. Uh, and, and using a lot of medical terms, they all think he was crazy. That, that was your opinion. He was crazy. But if it is true that he saw what he says he saw, that he was definitely not crazy. This would have been a perfectly natural response to such an experience. What he saw was very intense, and especially the message he was told to give forth. He realized the seriousness of his calling and how great the responsibility placed on his shoulders. That's why he was in such a terrible state. Now, in, in, we see the prophet Ezekiel now going to be a watchman in verses 16 to 21. In these verses, we're going to see he's viewed as a watchman. The actual appointment of Ezekiel to be a watchman onto the house of Israel comes in verses 16 to 17. The appointment came in verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days, at the end of those seven days when he sat appalled and overwhelmed, at that point, the word of Jehovah came on to me saying, in verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Here he's told that he's a watchman. Now, what was the function of a watchman in ancient Israel? Well, watchmen were stationed in city walls or hilltops or, or specifically de designed watchtowers. And a watchman was to be on the alert for anything which might, which might spell danger for the city and warn the city's people of any impending attack. And this gave city dwellers outside the walls an opportunity to seek protection and gave the people time to secure the gates and man the defenses. Now, yeah, we have two biblical examples where we can see the work of a watchman in its literal sense. One is 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 24 to 27. And the other is 2 Kings 9, verses 17 to 20. Both of those, we see a watchman who's looking into the distance and he sees runners coming and he warns yells out now what a literal watchman in the wars was to a city the prophet was to the nation symbolically he was a watchman what was he doing uh, the prophet he was scanning the political and spiritual horizon 
He was warning the people of danger to come. If the people failed to heed their danger, they would fall. There are some other passages where we're told that a prophet is a watchman. For instance, in Isaiah 21, verse 6. Isaiah 21, 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 17. Hosea chapter 9, verse 8. And Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Now, spiritually speaking, the wall that protected Israel was their covenant relationship with the Lord. If they were to obey the terms of the covenant and blessings flowed, disobey and chastisement came. But we're told they were rebellious people, so they weren't obeying the covenants. Ezekiel is to be a watchman to two groups of people here within the nation of Israel. First of all, he's going to be a watchman to the wicked and also to the righteous. We see it concerning the wicked in verses 18 to 19. In verse 18, we have the case where the watchman, he gives no warning. When I, this is verse 18. When I say unto the wicked, thou shall surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Wow. When God speaks to the wicked and tells them they will surely die, the death, you know, you know, the, here, the death spoken of in these verses is death under the Mosaic law, okay, which would mean physical death. If God tells a prophet that such and such a man or, or, or such and such a city or, or a nation is about to die, and the prophet fails to give the warning, then the wicked will still die the physical death because of whatever sin they've committed. But God would require, would, would, would require the blood of the wicked at the hand of the prophet. This means the prophet's life would also be forfeit because he failed to warn. He failed to give the warning. The warning to the wicked was not in order that he might retain his salvation. It says in the middle of verse 18, in order to save his life. So this has a physical application. If the wicked remains in his iniquity, he will die physically. But his blood will I require at thy hand. This is the prophet's hand. So if God tells the prophet to give warning and he fails to do so, the lack of warning will not save the wicked from physical death. But God will bring judgment upon the watchman or the prophet. In verse 19. Yet, if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So if the prophet does give a warning to the wicked, but the wicked still refuse to abandon their wicked ways, then the wicked will die physically in his iniquity. But in this case, the prophet has delivered thy soul, his soul. He has ensured the safety of his own life. He would not suffer the death that would have followed had he failed to issue a warning. Now, in verses 20 to 21, he now turns to the righteous, and he makes a similar distinction between giving and not giving a warning. In verse 20, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteous deeds, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Here he talks about when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness. So the terms righteous man and righteousness here in the Old Testament, we must not give them a New Testament meaning, right? Uh, this is not imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. No righteousness was imputed to these in the Old Testament. The righteousness spoken of here is the righteousness of the Mosaic law. One's degree of righteousness in this case was determined by his degree of conformity 
to the law of Moses. Because remember, the law of Moses at that time, that was the rule of life. Obedience to the law brought life. Disobedience brought physical death. So the text is referring to someone who has, for a period of time, conformed to the law of Moses over some issue. But then he turns away and begins to go contrary to the Mosaic law in the very thing where he has been obedient. He would then begin to commit iniquity, doing the things contrary to the Mosaic law and in violation of the law. And so at some point, God would lay a stumbling block before him and he shall die. Again, refers to physical death here in keeping with the requirements of the Mosaic law. If the prophet has failed to warn him against turning away from his righteous conformity to the law, it won't excuse the previously righteous man. He will still die physically because of his disobedience. His previous righteous deeds will not weigh in his favor now in order to save his life. In addition, it says his blood will I require at thy hand. So his blood, this is the, 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 the righteous man who has gone wayward and, and is now non-conforming to the law. His blood would now also be required at the prophet's hand because he failed to warn him. So, good example. Take the case of an individual who has been conforming very well to the standard of God's righteousness as given the Mosaic law. A prophet would still, could still warn him not to turn away from his righteousness. Keep going in that way. You're doing well. Let's say that he went and committed a murder or adultery. He turned away. Under the Mosaic law, a murderer or an adulterer is to be executed. Physical death. He is to die a physical death. And all of his righteous deeds, which he had done up to that point, would not save him. You know, it's not like you know, I've got more pluses than minuses. Eh. It would not save him from the punishment which is properly described for adultery and murder. We have a really good biblical example here uh, although the penalty was not carried out we have an, a, a, an excellent example in king david uh, he was he was of someone who fell into this category for a period of time he was remember he was a man after god's own heart and it means he was righteous and one who conformed rather well to the standard of righteousness which the law demanded but sometime during his reign, he was guilty of adultery with Bathsheba, a later guilty of murdering her husband. Now, had the law been carried out in the case of David, all of the great things that he had accomplished on God's behalf would not be remembered. He would still have to be executed in accordance with the Mosaic law. But in his case, he himself was the authority as king to enforce the execution. He had no one over him but God. So in his case, he didn't order his own execution. But if the demands of the law had been applied, had he been anyone other than the king, then he would have died. Clearly, he would not have lost his salvation, but his physical life. Now in verse 21, Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, excuse me, he shall surely live because he took warning and thou hast delivered thy soul. So here we have the example of what happens when warning is given to a righteous man. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man, meaning a man who has been conforming to the Mosaic law, that the righteous sin that this man doesn't sin so that he does not turn away from the law and he does not sin and fall into disobedience he shall surely live because he took notice of the prophet's warning the prophet also has also delivered his own life because he gave the timely warning we must remember that this passage is dealing with the issue of conformity or the lack of it to the law of moses it does not deal with the loss of salvation, but with the retention or loss of physical life in keeping with the law of Moses. And with this, the section dealing with the actual call of Ezekiel to the prophetic office is now ended. And this is where we're going to leave it for this session. Thank you for coming along. Study hard, grow strong.